Welcome everyone. We'll begin in a few minutes once everyone gets settled in. Well, I can get started with my intro and then as people join the waiting room, I'll just continue to add them. Okay, so good evening and welcome to tonight's live virtual program presented by the Howell Carnegie District Library and the League of Women Voters of the Ann Arbor area Brighton Howell unit. I'm Amber from the Reference Adult Services Department here at the library. Thank you for joining us this evening. I have a few housekeeping items to share before we start the presentation. Tonight's program is scheduled to run until 8 p.m. During the program, all attendees will be muted, so report any technical issues you may have in the chat. During the presentations, chat messages will only be visible to hosts and monitored by me, Howell Library Adult Services. There will be a Q&A session after the presentation. If you have a question, please enter it at the, that time in the chat. We'll address as many audience questions as we can before the program ends. During the Q&A, messages in the chat will be visible to all meeting attendees. This program is being recorded and the recording will be available on the U library's YouTube channel soon after this live virtual program. If you do not want your video in the recording, make sure your video is turned off, that there is a red slash the camera icon in the bottom left corner of your Zoom window. Without further ado, I'll turn things over to Claire Donovan of our local League of Women Voters Unit. Thank you very much, Amber, and good evening, everybody. We want to welcome you to tonight's presentation of the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission's Community of Interest. Before we get started, I have a couple notes that I'd like to share with everybody. Uh, number one, the League of Women Voters, we are a nonpartisan voter education and advocacy group. I want to remind you that we do not support political parties or candidates. We do do independent studies and is of issues and proposals so that we might educate voters on choices that are available to them. The League does advocate for issues and proposals that they have studied. If this sounds interesting to you at all, please consider joining our chapter of the League of Women Voters, Ann Arbor, Brighton, Howell. Everybody is welcome. We would love to have you. And just because we're League of Women Voters, men, you are welcome to. Our guest speaker tonight will be MC Rothhorn. He's from Lansing and he is a member of the Redistricting Commission. We wanna thank him very much for spending the evening with us tonight. Also our League President, Ellen Lafferty will be presenting and Kathy Sayer who has been participating in this communities of interest process. So I'd also like to thank the Howell Library for hosting for us tonight. And we really hope that you'll consider joining the League of Women Voters. Thank you, Ellen. And I'm turning it over to our League President, Ellen. Thank you, Claire. Uh, and thanks everybody again for joining us tonight. And of course, the Howell Library for doing such a stellar job in hosting uh, this evening's presentation. Uh, just to give you a, a overview of what's in store for you tonight, we're going to break um, our presentation into sort of three different parts. The first is that we're going to describe what is redistricting. It's a little bit of the history of redistricting. Then we're going to look at how the commission was chosen and what are the tasks that they have. And then the third part is delving into the communities of interest. As Claire said, Kathy has um, gone through rigorous training with the league on these community of COI, let's call it, communities of interest. And she's gonna take over at that time. So let's get started. All right, redistricting in Michigan. Citizens, not politicians are going to draw the lines. The lines for um, 
let's see if I have this right here. I'm sorry. Here we go. Following every census, every 10 years, the distribution of um, the congressional state, House, and Congress districts are re reviewed and redrawn every 10 years um, following the national census. After population shifts are identified, I don't want to use the word growth or loss. I'm going to use the word shift. Folks move around. Michigan started with one congressional seat back in 1837. Then we peaked at 19 seats or districts in the 1960s, most likely um, because of the auto industry, the industrial revolution and so forth, brought so many more of our pop the population to Michigan. But since then, we've slowly lost one seat every time. And it looks like we might possibly be down to 13 districts rather than the current 14 that we are right now. Again, we gained 2% in our population, but that population shifted to other states in the country, um, causing that representation to be changed elsewhere. So redistricting is a process I'm trying to get this spread thing to work. Okay, my apologies here. So what's important to know is that despite redistricting in other states, every state has to use its own process of drawing their district lines every 10 years. So how exactly are those long lines drawn? Well, first off, there's gonna be federal requirements that they have to follow. And of course, every 10 years, but most importantly, it, you have to remember the one person, one vote requirement established by the US Supreme Court. And also, um, while the law, laws state how many people must live in each district, it doesn't specify how those lines are, lines are drawn. There's no rules. But we also have the Voting Rights Act that blocks um, distribution that, that makes sure that no one is denied um, their voice. For example, it says that to participate in the political process and to elect representatives of their choice. Sometimes results in districts where a recognized minority makes up the majority of the population. The 14th Amendment of the US Constitution assures that there's going to be equal representation, equal protection. And that's on the, um, the 14th Amendment there. But the problem has been in the past, both sides of the aisle have manipulated elections to keep themselves and their party in power. Um, there was an actual person whose name was Eldridge Gary. Um, he was a governor of Massachusetts in 1812. He was the first person who signed a bill that created the very first partisan district. It was the shape of a mythological salamander, hence the term gerrymandered. The takeaway is that politicians over the years have used gerrymandering to make elections fit to their own special interests. So here's an example of how these line, lines are drawn to suit those special interests. In the first box to the left, it has no lines whatsoever. 40% of the residents are purple, pick a party, and 60% are green. That second box on the left shows districts that are called compact. The lines are drawn vertically and outcome matches the party distribution. Those are compact and fair. So the two purple districts get 40%, and the green districts are getting the 60%. So green rules because they have um, more voters. The next one though, is where the districts are compact, but it's unfair because the outcome is that the green wins every single time, just because the lines are horizontal rather than vertical, not a true representation of voters. And then the last one on the right, shows districts that are neither compact nor fair. And note that the hard turns in the lines that are drawn to suit whoever was drawing the lines at that time. That's gerrymandering. 
And this is the example of gerrymandering that was published in the Washington Post a few years back. It doesn't represent any political party, so don't think it does. And as you can see, the lines are drawn that determines the outcome, which have been drawn to suit special interests. In the first example, this is what's called cracking. And what they do is those districts are sorted or separated. The community has been cracked. So they can't elect their own representatives. Again, purple seems to be set aside or ignored when these communities are cracked to benefit the Green Party. The next one on the right shows packing partisans into one district so that the other party wins the adjacent districts. In this case, this is packed so that one party will win all of the adjacent districts, three out of the four areas. That's cracking and packing, which is what they have to avoid completely. So let's have a general understanding of how Michigan's current districts actually look. This is the Michigan State House, and I'm sorry, I don't think it's a very true to true image of it, but it's what it is. And this is from 2012, and it's going to be used, these districts are in place until 2022, November of 2022, when we elect our next set of House Representatives. There's 110 Michigan members, and they are elected um, on even numbered years for two-year terms. And with that current term expiring December 31st of 2022, each representative is limited to serving three terms or six years, ter six terms if they are, I'm sorry, six years if they are reelected. And just to give you an idea of how large these are, how they are sorted, they are average about 77 to 91,000 residents. And I'm not picking sides here, but it's actually about the size of one Spartan stadium. No slight against U of M, but Spartan Stadium fits that size of a house um, district. And here in Livingston County, we have two of those districts, the 42nd house seat represented by Ann Bolin. And we also have the 47th seat by Bob Zott. And so that gives you an idea of those house districts and how large they are. Then we move on up to the Michigan State Senate. And again, this is the 2012 map um, based on the 2010 census. The Senate has 38 members in their district. They have about 212,000 up to 263,000 residents in their districts. That's equal to roughly three Spartan stadiums or it's three times the representation of a house seat. So they're elected at the same time as the governor and they serve for a four year term and they're limited to two four year terms. So a total of eight years. And in our district that we're familiar with is the 22nd <laughs> district in Livingston County where we're represented by Senator Lana Tice. And now we get on to the US House. Again, I'm sorry for this a little bit of distorted map, but it's, it's what we have. Here we're talking Washington, DC. There are 435 members of Congress. And these members are reallocated among the states after each census. And because of quickly growing population, again, Michigan's gone from 12 into the 1900s up to 19, now we're down to 14, possibly, probably back down to 13 again. And just to keep in perspective, we're still in the top 10 of the states as far as the number of representatives. So we still have a significant amount of representation. And each congressional district has about 710,000 people in each district. And they have one representative who's elected for a two year term. And in this case, there's no term limits. They can be elected again and again and again. 
and Livingston County resides in the Michigan's 8th Congressional District, and that's represented, represented by Alyssa Flatkin. So to get on to this gerrymandering, this is one of the worst cases of gerrymandering in the entire country. You can see on the left side, we, it covers Oakland and Wayne County, and you can see the list of the communities in that box on the left. And this is Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence's seat, which has a 79% Democratic base. Over 80% of the population in the 14th district is African-American. It doesn't quite look like a salamander, but you get the idea. And I want you to take a quick look at Farmington Hills. What were they thinking when they thought Farmington Hills is best represented by carving out that little niche that they did there? And so no wonder folks thought we need to change this. This has to, something has to happen. So how do we get this M-I-C-R-C, -C, I'm gonna call it, rather than spelling it out each and every time, is how is that M-I-C-R-C -C put together? And I'm really um, pleased with um, MC Rothorn of Lansing, who's going to jump in um, from here on, I guess I should say, uh, to okay. add a little more clarity to this. Just a little bit of background. Prop 2 in 2018, 61% of Michigan voters voted in favor of it. That's almost two thirds of the voters in Michigan said, yeah, we need to change this. And they created that, bo that body called the ICRC. And it's made up of 13 commissioners. And they, the purpose of that Prop 2 is that no longer would politicians draw those lines. It's voters are gonna draw those lines. And um, it also sets standards to ensure that we have a transparent, impartial, and a fair process above all. <clears throat> so they are required to draw these. Um, this is the process they have to go through. And um, I, I'm going to get into the four Democrats, four Republicans later on in the five independents. But above all, all business has to be in the open. All, all um, meetings, either just the commission themselves or all these public meetings have to be open to the whole general public. And the positive, one of the few positive things of this pandemic is the way we can watch it virtually. You can watch any meeting anywhere in the state virtually. And so that's a bonus. If you can't make one night, hop and look at the schedule, which we'll share at the end of this meeting. Um, and hop on it and see it somewhere else. So that's going to be um, fascinating to watch. And they, of course, they cannot draw lines that favor any political party or candidate. Amen. So what does that commission look like? Um, we have four Democrats, four Republicans, and five independents. Now, independents can still be recognized, let's say, with the Green Party or um, Libertarians or whatever, but they are not recognized as Republicans or Democrats. They align with an independent party. So what's really nice is that those voices are heard as well. It seems like they're washed away every election. They just, they're always there, but they just have struggle getting um, through the elections. But um, this gives them a voice on this commission. And there's two eligibility qualifications here. You have to be registered to vote and 18 years old, of course. You have to be a citizen. And the, the next big requirement is to submit an application. And if anybody would like to look at anyone's application, you can see those on the MICRC website. All those applications have been scanned and uploaded so you can get a little bit of the background in each and every one of those 13 representatives. And so, um, MC, do you mind covering this selection process, having lived it as you have? 
Sure. I don't mind at all. Thank um, you. So um, maybe uh, I'll offer that it was uh, simple, just like, yeah, was said. I, I simply filled it in a ballot and there's a random selection process. I'm looking at this on my phone, so forgive me. Um, and I identify as, as a Democrat. And so I was, um, I watched a, uh, a sort of a, the selection process was held uh, virtually. It was filmed essentially with a, um, uh, a statistician. I think it was a CPA firm that essentially talked through on the film for 15 minutes, sort of like what the selection process was, how it was randomly selected. And they, you know, took the, the pool of 10,000, like it says here, you know, and selected out only the Democrats and then randomly selected four, you know, and they talked about it. So that's, that's really how it worked. It wasn't just sort of like a, you know, lottery ball, but it was a, you know, sophisticated process and it's, it's, it's on the, it's on the website. And um, yeah, we're there, all, all 13 of us are there. And what I want to acknowledge is that we're, we're just as qualified as you all, right? We're not necessarily um, citizens that have any more understanding of this process than you do. It's the first one. And I just want to acknowledge that each of you will like help us as the commissioners, like sort of create something that feels like a, a, a trusting, um, a trusted form of government that is brand new right now. So we're asking a lot of folks um, and we're still at a, you know, we still have about 60%, right? Um, who voted for us, um, uh, excuse me, vote, not voted for us, voted for this amendment um, and created the commission. There's about 60% who understand what the commission is in the, in the state of Michigan. And there's 40% who, who either don't care or don't know. And so that's a, that's a significant am amount. So the, the idea that citizens like you, like me, have an impact on this process is essentially what I'd, I'd like to highlight and, and to create that fair and transparent process um, we need as many people looking in and sort of sharing voices uh, to, yeah, I guess to create the, allow the selection process to actually tra translate into something that feels like a, uh, a trusted, um, yeah, set of maps. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, well, here comes the challenging part is that map approval. How in heaven's name are you guys gonna get around to that? I shouldn't say guys, ladies and gentlemen are getting around to that. Um, the constitution was very clear on their criteria on what rules you had to follow. And I guess at the end of the day, there's gonna be no more gerrymandering. That's the bottom line here is that we will not have any more gerrymandering. No political party is going to draw our district lines anymore. Um, the first two here, uh, and this is in order of priority, and um, the first two are the federal guidelines. They are following the Constitution and the Voting Rights Act, and they also say you have to be geographically contiguous. In other words, you can't take Beaver Island and add it to St. Clair Shores, so that district. It has to be um, contiguous to that. Um, and if you don't mind, MC, do you mind talking about those other priorities? Because you're living and breathing them. No, I don't mind. Um, yeah, so the first two are the, the federal ones. And the, the first state recognized um, criteria that we are guided by as the commission, um, the first one that is the number three, which is the communities of interest. And that is, um, that is something I believe that, um, gosh, um, yeah, that we'll have a presentation on later tonight. Mm -hmm. um, but it is the number one priority for the, the drafters of this of this uh, amendment, and it's um, uh, it's 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 been um, a, a successful uh, process. Communities of interest are, are used in California as well as in Arizona, and there's other states that I'm just not aware of. But they've used communities of interest um, to help draw the lines to redistrict, um, and like I said, with with positive in, uh, out outcomes because of the citizen input on what do what is the community of interest um, then yeah and these and I think this is also what's also brilliant about this this criteria is it is prioritized and because we're randomly selected this is also where the qualifications you know that uh, any citizen really can understand and redistrict there's a lot of complexity I don't want to I don't want to minimize the complexity here but the idea that each of us has a has a role 
um, these criteria sort of guide us in ways that we have to we have to make decisions, hard decisions, really, like which um, which community of interest is is, is more important, uh, so that we don't pack or crack. But the, the the goal of these criteria, I think, are to help us everyday citizens understand what the the best um, and most uh, important criteria uh, to to weigh is, and therefore, um, yeah, each of us can participate. So I just you know I think each of us can read it. There's seven of them. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it, it's like I said, it's not an easy choice at the end of the day, but there are clear priorities and they're written out in the, in the, the you know, article, article four, section six of our, of our Michigan constitution. I Thank hope that you. helps. Yeah. Oh, it does immensely. Um, and I think the gist of this slide right here is kind of tells how you have to get along. And before they vote on a map, it's gotta be tested. They gotta use appropriate technology for it and they meet the criteria of the constitution. And also it requires a majority vote in which at least two of each Democrat and Republican parties have to vote for it. And plus, um, uh, let's see, uh, and the independents as well. And sounds like, again, you have to have a majority. So seven of the 13 have to vote in favor of the map proposed. If they don't get along, and if the voting requirements can't be met, then each one of those 13 commissioners are going to submit one final map for each state house, senate, and congressional district. And then the secretary of state's office would choose among these final maps. In other words, you've got to get along because that's who would want to go there? I can't imagine. Um, anything else you want to add to that? Am I skipping anything there? No, I would just offer that this particular requirement, it is, it is, is particularly for the, um, for the maps. And we have been getting along well. I think it's, uh, right, we haven't been, um, uh, gosh, we, we had to decide, for example, if we, um, you know, on, on the staff that we have, have um, hired, Right for on, on behalf of the commission, and so making decisions like you know how to who to hire, right? There were you know it was contentious, and so we've gotten to that point where we we've practiced and we I think we know each other well. And I suppose what I want to suggest here is this this requirement. This is a very high bar for for the maps, and it is a simple let's say a simple majority um, uh, with some of the other decisions that we make on a daily basis. I shouldn't say daily on a weekly basis. We meet weekly. And um, yeah, we'll be instituting these requirements um, for the you know two two and you know a majority with each party represented. Um, that will be in, implemented um, with the maps and and has to do with some some of the decisions that we make that are related to uh, I guess the the heavy heavy lifting. If we're just adopting the uh, the agenda, for example, it's a simple majority. If we're yeah choosing staff or making choosing the maps, then we have these requirements, just like was said. Okay, thank you. All right, um, and then here's where the public is, is part of this process. Um, the public is able to attend 10 meetings and I know you've upped that. I believe you're at 16, the minimum is 10. And so um, bless them, they've brought it to 16 because it's a big state. And I, I do recall when they started with the 10, I'm sure little areas around the state said like, what about us? What about us? And they weren't being heard. And so at least 10, um, actually there's gonna be 16 public meetings are required before they start drawing those maps. And then at least five public hearings are required after those proposed maps are drawn and they must be open meetings above and all else. They're going to be open meetings that are gonna be accessible by way of the television or online. Uh, it sounds like they're not gonna be in person um, for these first 16. They, they, they will be. Oh, they will be. Oh, okay. All right. Our first one Again, is coming up. Go ahead, in, I'm sorry. Our first one's coming up May, um, I believe. Uh, let me, I've got it here. It's the second week of May. May 11th will be in Jackson, 
Um, so that'll, that'll kick us off. And then we have, you know, eight weeks later, we'll finish on July 1st in Grand Rapids. All right. And I can, you know, I can give you more detail if you wish, but yeah, the, the public participation, which you're just describing is, uh, in, is in person and these public hearings are not the only way to give participation. We also have our regular meetings, weekly meetings, and there will also be, um, I guess, live streams. Every public hearing will also be live streamed, much like we're doing here. And, and you know, it's, it's important for me to recognize that we did, we get a lot of um, comment, public comment during our meetings um, from written public comment, I should say, emails uh, from Livingston County, where there was a, a, a great desire to have um, a meeting, excuse me, I shouldn't say a meeting, a public hearing. I'm distinguishing between a, we're in a town hall right now. Mm -hmm. the, the, the commission meets every week right now. And then these public hearings are the 16 that will be um, uh, in, engaging in during the month of May and June. And so right now, we really appreciate the League of Women Voters, you know, especially because Livingston County was asked you know, has asked for a lot of members from Livingston County have asked for representation or somehow to have a public hearing. We couldn't accommodate all these requests. So things like this right now are, are super valuable to have partners like the League of Women Voters um, to be able to reach out to the, the, the folks that, that want to be heard. So um, this, is, this is very much um, part of this public participation, what we're doing right now. And, and um, yeah, like you said, 16. Um, and then yeah. we'll draw the maps after that. Like we won't even, we haven't even started drawing any maps. And I see that um, you're not allowed to discuss um, any of these redistricting matters unless it's in a public format, unless That's you're right. referring to a past meeting um, and so forth. And so yeah. by the way, I just wanted to plug in one more thing for the league. April 29th is a national day of action for people powered maps. So there's something happening in all 50 states today or this week that's addre addressing um, the topic of redistricting across the country. So it's, we're very, very lucky to have Prop 2 that has passed and now we're living that process, but other states would like to be right where Michigan is right today. Uh, so I just wanna put that plug in for the National League. And so then after the plan is adopted, the commission must publicize the plan and report, um, provide a report explaining its decision and what materials they used. And I expect MC, I know you spoke about this at a last hearing I saw that you're gonna expect the legal challenges as a result of these maps. Can you talk about that a little bit? What, we, what we've been told, you know, because this is the first one in Michigan, what we've been using are examples from California and from um, uh, Arizona who have gone through a similar kind of um, independent citizens redistricting commission and they're in their second round. So they did it 10 years ago, um, their first rounds both, and they have told us that we can expect those legal challenges. Um, and that, um, you know, I guess any, you know, anytime you have change, right, the, the people in power, you know, will challenge it. And so it's, it's anticipated. And I think because of that, what we, and because we're also mandated um, by the constitution to have this open and transparent meetings process and therefore, Right, you can't talk about it in back rooms outside of the process. To create that fair, transparent process, we create a record, and we believe that it, as because we're holding ourselves to that, um, we also believe that we will uh, minimize the the amount of legal challenges that we and we believe that we will be able to actually get our maps passed, and that the, any judicial um, body will will look at the uh, you know sort of the record that we have created understand why we have created these maps and drawn the lines where we have and dismiss the, the legal challenge. So that's part of, I don't wanna say it's part of our strategy. I don't think it's too too much. I think that is true. Um, and I believe that, you know, it's also, it's the right thing to do. It's the fair, transparent, and frankly, representational way to, to do this as, as citizens, so. Well, there's one more rub to this whole timeline here is that supposedly you have to have these maps drawn by November 1st of 2021. And could you just talk a second about the Michigan Supreme Court and where they stand in all of this? Yes, um, so to keep it to a second, it's basically we've, we've asked for relief. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's brief. <laughs> it's yeah. impossible. It's impossible to um, publish these maps by September 30th, is that correct? And you're not getting the census information until what date? Uh, August 
um, well, so we're anticipating the, the, the release and at around the end of August. And because okay. of the 45-day turnaround, right, in order to use the, the, the census data that would be released in, at the end of August, in order to actually um, get the 45 days turnaround to create a map or to create the, the map that would need to be then um, shared in a second round of public hearings, right? The, on, this, on the slide that we're looking at here, it says five after the proposed maps are drawn, right? That's what I'm referring to is, right? We can basically draw the maps now without the census data, but then they're not really complete until that census data is released. And then we you know, apply it and drop it in and see how it shifts and changes things and then go back for another, we're gonna, instead of five, we're gonna do uh, eight in a oh, second okay. round. And so that's where that, you know, that November 1st deadline um, is, is related to the 45 days and the census data does not allow us to actually um, uh, accomplish that in time. And so we have petitioned the court in conjunction with the um, Secretary of State because they will administer essentially the maps, right? They will turn these maps into ballots, right? So mm -hmm. they have a, a great interest in this timeline and. Um, so we have uh, together, right, the commission, as well as the Secretary of State, um, petitioned the Supreme Court for relief from this, um, from those dates, um, and have asked, you know, not to have it be too much, you know, into the future, we want to have it done this year. Um, but we recognize that in order to complete the process and have that fair and, and um, I guess, um, trusted outcome, we have to be able to um, take, maybe we have to take the time to, to complete it. Thank you. Well, time will tell. That's for sure. All right. Um, at this point, um, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy Sayer, who has been active in these training sessions offered by the league in identifying and contacting these groups. Kathy. Hi, everyone. Um, so the role of the League of Women Voters of Michigan and the Michigan Independent Redistricting Commission um, the league is trying to help by monitoring meetings. We actually have a committee and um, at the state level and they volunteer and split up the schedule so that they watch and monitor every meeting to make sure that everything's being done um, exactly as it should be. And they've helped um, with some coordination of some key staff. So as we focus on um, communities of interest, which is a new concept within a new process, um, our part as citizens right now, after our passing a proposal two in 2018, this is the part that we the people get to shape by doing the communities of interest. The other groups that are helping with communities and identifying them are voters, not politicians, who are the people who the grassroots grassroot group who um, started Proposal 2. Also, Michigan Nonprofit Association and the NAACP. And if there's any communities that don't fall under those three groups, then that's where the league wants to step in and help. So the goal of these groups is to identify them and connect with them and support them in participating in the redistricting by aiding them in how to testify, how to provide the maps and information options. Next. So now we're gonna dig into um, the crucial topic, just what are communities of interest. Why are they so important right after the federal law in drawing the election district lines in Michigan? So what are COIs? There's only three things to define them. Cultural characteristics, historical characteristics, economic interests. So this slide is what the Michigan Constitution tells us about a community of interest. And it's very bare bones, as you can see. No other definition is provided. So again, we, the people, have the opportunity to share our ideas on this new concept. A COI must be able to identify the contiguous physical boundaries of the area that they deem as their COI.
and the commission has to define, they can't look to other states and because it's a new concept in Michigan and the key to the process. So Michigan is in an enviable position. Having moved the job of creating election district lines from gerrymandered legislatures to an independent commission of voters. But the whole process is brand new and largely not known to or understood by the people. On top of that, the crucial 2020 census was delayed, which um, MC just spoke about and how that's gonna have to change. Hopefully they've asked um, for that change through the Michigan Supreme Court. And he also mentioned that we really can't look to the other states because the other states may have communities of interest, but they're not set up um, under the same constitutional restrictions or have more restrictions than what we're allowed to do. So we, we have to define our own, it's our job. And these three, the, um, the federal law and geographic um, contiguousness plus the communities of interest rate higher than consideration of county, city and township boundaries and being reasonably compact. Kathy? Yes. Would you mention what, what communities of interest are not specifically in the definition or who may not be a community of interest? There's, a, there's one more thing that I think might be useful for our, yeah. our friend listening. We didn't get a slide that was provided on that and I did not write all of that and down. I know that it can't, it can't have to do with um, a political party. It cannot favor a political party and then not can, cannot favor any um, politicians in general. Yes. And, or and work against them either way. That seems to be the most important thing. Yeah, that you're not allowed to create a community around political will. Correct. Yeah. Or against any political will. Yeah. All right. So we're going to talk about some examples of the COIs and they're listed some of them here which you can read. So I won't read all of those. I will mention though that the U of M Ford School Center for um, Local State and Urban Policy, which the acronym is close up without the E, they, they gave their students an assignment um, earlier and they asked them to look for possible COIs in Michigan. And the students found a possibility of a thousand COIs without doing very much of a deep dive, just by looking at interests, um, doing searches on the internet. But to help you to grasp maybe some of the concept of that, um, there's a few more examples I'll share that I've learned by doing some of the other trainings. And these are all just merely examples because like I said, the students could find a thousand. So some other examples are uh, Battle Creek for believes that they identify with the I-94 I corridor um, because of they shop there, they work there, they do their business there. And right now they're grouped in with Grand Rapids and they don't really feel like they have a relationship there. So they would their plan to make a presentation, testimony and draw maps and present it to the, um, the commissioners. Another one might be um, say the Arab communities down around the Dearborn area. Um, the zip code 48217 is one of the worst in our state and possibly the nation for air quality. And they also have other environmental concerns. So that zip code area or areas around it, or maybe just part of the zip code might wanna become a, a community of interest. Um, then mid Michigan, the example there has to do with, you've all heard the story about when the dams broke and areas lost their lakes. So there's a lot of citizens now that are sitting on um, like a swamp bed in front of them. <laughs> and they need, to, they need to have representation to figure out what's gonna happen with that area and how to make sure that this doesn't happen anywhere else in the state um, with dams that break. 
So those are just a few examples. Like I said, there's, there's many of them out there. So these communities of interest matter because they are the third criteria, as MC mentioned, in the building blocks for the legislative and congressional districts. Um, so why is that? And finally, we get to the political theory. The fundamental purpose is to group members of a COI in a single district rather than scatter them among two or more. If you remember the concept in the gerrymandering slides about cracking. Particular voters among several election districts is to weaken their ability to elect one of them. The same principle applies to grouping members of a COI together in a different context, the context of electing and then influencing a lawmaker that will hopefully take on their interests. So how do we get involved? Great question. <laughs> I was waiting for the slide. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's okay. Um, so you can attend the public hearings um, in your area or um, as either an individual or as a member of a group that want to give yeah. testimony. And Kathy, um, we want to emphasize it's not just in your area. You can attend anyone. I mean, true. We're, ideally. Okay. Okay. Yeah, true. You could, yes, travel across straight the state if that was a better day for you. You can go anywhere. And you can also submit testimony and maps. Um, besides at the public hearings, you can do it um, via the MCI. CRC portal or by US mail. You can also, if you need help in any of these areas, contact their local league for more information about communities of interest, either at the state level, which is the lwvmi.org or our very own Livingston County um, League of Women Voters, Brighton Howell area.org. And I'm going to jump in here and share this. This is our league website. And I wanted to share with everybody how we have um, this tonight's event. But underneath it, I'm going to go over here to the left and increase this text size um, just to show you our fancy new website. But this lists all that information that Kathy mentioned about where to find those meetings, what those dates are, um, the documents, the connection to the League of Women Voters of Michigan. This is really um, putting a lot of legwork um, to make sure this is done above board and fairly. And then a little bit of background information about redistricting on that. And I wanna go to, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, we're there still is seeing- the state Website. We're still just seeing the slide. Yeah, we're not seeing our website. But as you can see here, oh, you are? No, yeah, we're not you, just seeing, we're seeing the slide. You might oh, have to I go apologize. do share screen again and choose um, the oh, website. My, my, my mistake, I'm sorry. Let's try this. Uh, okay. Here is the ICRC website through Michigan Secretary of State. And here you can see where those meetings are, as MC said, um, let's see. And here's the actual 2021 meeting schedule. Again, you can find this for yourself, but this gives you the actual locations, the times that they start and so forth. And again, there's lots of information. I apologize, here's that website of the League of Women Voters of the Brighton Howell area. And again, we have lots of links and information there um, for anybody to access. Hopefully in about a few more days, we're gonna have the link to a, this recording. So you can then go over this information one more time. So I think at this point, I'm gonna stop sharing and we're gonna go to our, um, uh, back to uh, the Howell Library to answer any questions that went, might've been submitted. Yeah, so uh, I haven't seen anything yet, but feel free to start typing some stuff in the chat and I'll read out your questions. 
In the meantime, I'll share a link to our event evaluation just so people can work on that or open it up in another tab. And we hope that this pres presentation um, starts some conversations in your area so that you can start building good representation through a COI near, you know, that you feel is important to you. Um, this is a very new and historical venture for us citizens to be involved in. Mm -hmm. Mark mm -hmm. asks, will the slides be available for download? And I can, I'll send a follow-up email after this program and I can, I can attach the presentation because I believe I have a copy of that. So I yeah, can I'll share see. that. Um, I, Amber, I'm going to, I've, I've modified it just a little bit and I'll mm -hmm. send you my newest one tonight. Okay, and I'll wait for be, that one. And that'll be a PDF format for everybody. Okay. I see a hand raised. Let's see. I can Eva, I can ask you to unmute if you'd like, and then you could um, speak to us if you don't want to type in the chat. Let's see. Am I unmuted? Yeah. Sorry, I was doing something with my hand, so I didn't. <laughs> I couldn't do both, but um, I this so this meeting is is like an information meeting, and I also received something about um, going to uh, to learn how to. Oh, what was that? It was something to do with. Uh, um, hang on, I, I should I don't have my. Um, the uh, <laughs> to to participate in it um, training some kind of training. Do you, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Oh, maybe I misunderstood mm -hmm. the whole email I got. Um, you might have received something from an organization, maybe voters, not politicians, or NAACP, or the yeah. And I could re and I registered for an event. Is that another learning one like this is, or is that one that you is more of a hands-on? That might be a separate organization. I don't know what that one yeah. is, so it might you can. I don't know if you have it in an email, but it might be from somewhere I'll, else. I'll look at it later. Yeah. Um, this has been very informative um, uh, as far as as far as understanding. I, I I was interested in it, so I appreciate you giving us all the information. Thank you. Yeah, so do you have a community of interest you were thinking of, a group that you think needs to be represented, or well, are you just trying to get information about what those groups would be? Well, uh, partly I was wondering what the groups would be, but also I was thinking about um, I see have a high school athlete. And, and high school conferences and schools that we presently play, I think that it's important to um, the camaraderie and the competition that we are existing now, try to keep that the same as it has been. Um, I don't know if that's something you look at also as far as high schools go. It sounds like you're interested in sort of exploring if, if school districts and sort of the 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 the, the comp, like the, the the schools that compete within each you know that that with, district yeah, or within districts, our conference yeah if mm -hmm. your conference yeah it mm -hmm. sounds like that's something that's interesting and may define a community and that could I mean that's sort of an educational um sort of active you know aspect but I suppose it would be interesting to sort of continue to say okay well is, is there an economic relationship too for example in, right. or do we do we share cultural um histories. I mean, there's all sorts of ways to, to expand on that. And I, and so I would suggest, yeah, I would suggest, yeah, it's, it's worth exploring and trying to look at that conference and, and understand with, with as many people and, and other parents or, or, the, or the, the kids themselves, right. To see right. like, how, how do we identify, like, what is, what are the pieces that make up, you know, is it only educational um, or that, yeah, this conference competition, so to speak, that, that keeps right. us together, or is it, is there something more behind this? Right. Okay. I, the I'm beauty, kind of, huh? Go ahead. The beauty is that you're, it's self-defined. Like you get to explore it, and I think the more the more that you understand it and can share it with the commission, the more that we can actually give that definite, like define it as mm -hmm. you all, you know, you and your community of interest, right? Define yourselves. We can actually translate that into the lines and understand. The more we understand what you, yeah, the more okay. we understand why. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for answering. Thank you very much. You. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. All right, we have another question in the chat from Anna. She says, has the location of the second set of meetings been determined? Can we possibly host one of the second meetings of five in Livingston County? So that's gonna be challenging because um, what we're looking at, we're, 
like like every government institution, right? We have a budget and we right, we're using taxpayer dollars. So we really try to be judicious and 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 efficient. And one of the ways that we could do that was when we hosted these 16, if we, you know, we know that we're going to be back within, you know, within three months. So we're booking both at the same time. So the 16 um, of the 16, we will be going back to half of them. So the next eight will be there. So that is, you know, sort of the unfortunate answer. But again, I think you understand the reasoning. And again, these um, these these public hearings at the locations do not mean that Livingston County cannot be represented or shared. You know, like there's there's every avenue available during uh, those public hearings, virtually as well as otherwise. So yeah, and and like in town halls like this. And the very first one that's being offered in Jackson is fairly close, really. Yes, thank you. And that's coming up in May, uh, was it May 12th, I said, I believe, yeah. Uh, May 11th, sorry, 11th. May 11th yeah. They're always a Tuesday or Thursday. That's another thing to know. <laughs> All right, we have another from, I'm not sure if this is Joellen or Jolene. Um, it says, to Mr. Rothorn, obviously with all of the group information and recommendations for COIs across the state, and with the mention that one group has already identified more than a thousand COIs, I'm wondering if the commission has a method in mind for grouping, classifying, or weighing the criteria or COIs to be applied to the process. I suppose what we're trying to do is make it as open um, as possible, um, meaning we're trying to create, uh, let's say, a structure. Um, and I hope, we hope to have that more defined or more structured to answer this question, like within the next like few weeks, right? But we, we're still in process. We do not have a, a, a let's say either a definition like a, that's, that I could share with you now, nor do we have sort of a, a, a strict process. Um, so I guess my answer really is like, we're, we're working on it. And I think we're gonna try to make it as, um, as flexible and as open as possible. We're, we're, what we're trying to do is make sure that every person can be heard and not just the loudest voices or the most organized or the most, yeah. And I see a hand up for David. I don't know what you have in the chat. Yeah, um, I can ask him to unmute if he wants to ask a question. Uh, hey guys. Uh, yeah, I have two questions. Uh, uh, Mr. Rothorn, you mentioned, I believe you mentioned, or somebody mentioned that all of these meetings are supposed to be in public. So, you know, uh, I don't trust like a lot of people. Um, what are the penalties if the meetings, if some meetings were to be held not public? I mean, that's a great question. Um, my understanding is that, uh, I mean, so I, I have no one, I have no way of, making a meeting uh, without the, the, our staff, right? And that they follow Open Meetings Act regulations. And so those are always posted. So I, I don't know if I have a very good answer for you, um, but I will say that personally, one of the reasons I'm motivated to make these open and transparent meetings and not to have conversations with my colleagues on the commission out, you know, in sort of back room, one of the reasons I'm motivated is because I want us to actually use our taxpayer dollars wisely and I don't want to have legal challenges that keep going on and on and on. And if we do, if we, it, you know, if it's proven that we had backroom meetings, the penalty, I suppose, is that we, the state of Michigan, like, pays more money in, in uh, trying to defend it. So I don't know if that's a very good answer, but that's honestly the only one I have. No, it's well, and, and you can't answer what you don't know. I get that. Uh, but if the law doesn't have teeth, well, then. It's, it's, you know, kind of not very interesting in my opinion. Okay, so I have another question too. Um, can a community of interest define who is not them? Yeah, well, that's, that's a great question. That is one of the reasons we want people to um, share. Right? There, so I'll give you an example from Arizona that we heard. There, was a, there were two tribes in the, within the boundary of the state and one tribe was smaller the, and the, the land mass of the second tribe sort of surrounded the first. And because they were two different tribes, the elders decided that, hey, we don't actually want to belong to this first tribe. Like we're, we're a second tribe, we're, we're different, right? And we, have a, we want separate representation. We don't want to belong in one district right. with, right? 
And so Arizona took that into consideration and, and, and drew, you know, separated them. Um, so I suppose that that's an example. We haven't done that in Michigan yet, right? But that's, that's a great, yes. The answer, I think, to your question is yes. And we have every intention of, of trying to understand why. And, you know, again, for, for, for reasons that help, the more reasoning you give us why you want to be separate or why a community of interest would want to be separated, that's, that's what we can, we can work with that. Sure, and one of one of the big concerns that I think that uh, Ellen pointed out that seems to drive everyone crazy is these these goofy maps, you know, because they don't have nice uh, rectangles and trapezoids and happy stuff like that. Well, I don't see this as improving that at all. There's there's no requirement that we're going to have geographically pleasing districts, especially when these districts can cut across cities and townships and you know. I mean, I, I, I see the thing is just being kind of pointless. And, 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 but the point is when the legislature controls it, that means people have to be active and they have to get good legislative representation. This notion of a, of a pretty district is, you know, because it's aesthetically pleasing, is absurd. The, the aesthetically pleading, pleasing one being sort of following the lines, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, having a nice, you know, rectangular shape or something like that. And, you know, most of the uh, the districts that were shown, they make sense. Yeah, you get some oddball ones, um, whoop to do right. it. You know, I, and I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't understand the excitement about that. I think it's the excitement about why we should have those districts, is that right? Be well, pleasing? I, I don't see how this is going to change a lot of those things. Oh, well, yeah, I, and I, I agree with you. I'm not sure that it will change them. What I, I do believe we will, one of the, there's the sixth criteria of those seven that we, you know, that um, we went through earlier. The sixth one is districts shall reflect consideration of county, city, and township boundaries. And what I've been told is that the reason we have that sixth priority is be, and, and to sort of and to get to your point about it being pleasing if we stay within those boundaries then it's easier for clerks to administer and that means it's cheaper to, sure. to, to run ballots right to run elections so i don't i think that's the only reason that i'm aware of right that we might want to stay within the boundaries or you know and sometimes the counties are drawn kind of funny too right they're not always boxes and but yeah 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 nature nature has some funny ways of helping yeah <laughs> yeah okay that those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, MC, our time is up. Um, it's a little after eight o'clock. We just went over just a tad, but there was good conversations and great questions. Thank you everyone for attending tonight. I'm gonna to turn it back to Amber and she's going to wrap it up, the housekeeping uh, for the library. And again, thank you Howa Library um, and Kathy, Claire and MC, especially for joining us this evening. All right. Thank you so much, Ellen, Mr. Rothorn, Kathy, and Claire for sharing about the MICRC, redistricting in Michigan, and communities of interest. Thanks again to our partner, the League of Women Voters of the Ann Arbor Area Brighton Howell Unit, for making this evening possible. Visit their website, www.lwbbrightonhowellarea.org, to learn more about the organization and how you can become involved. And thank you all for attending tonight's program. We hope you enjoyed it. Please take a few minutes to tell us what you thought about this program in the short event evaluation linked in the chat. And I'll also email that out among you know, the slides and other stuff like that in a follow-up email. Visit our website, www.howellibrary.org to discover more upcoming events from the Howell Carnegie District Library. Good night, everyone. Thank you for coming.